Give the biggest warm applause for Luke. All right. I hope we got some good reflection time after the activity. Um, yeah. It's like a good piece of chunk. So, yes, like Lena mentioned, the whole providence is leading towards the Messiah. One man finding one woman to do what Adam and Eve could not do. But before I start, I just want to mention that even if you're not religious or, you know, may not have a relationship with God, Jesus as a historical figure changed the world. Regardless if you even believe he was resurrected because his death on the cross inspired an entire movement of people in this one little province, Judea, where followers of him, his, were getting martyred and was dying to spread the gospel. And in a few centuries, it became the religion of the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire in the world. And Christian traditions and values are imbued in all aspects of Western culture. You look at In God We Trust in our American currency, we see that our rights that the Declaration of Independence says come not from man, but from God. And it's all because of this one man who was considered a heretic in his time, but is now a staple of our culture today. But the whole reason for Jesus that we've been talking about is because he is supposed to be the Messiah, to do what Adam and Eve could not do. And what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to complete God's purpose of creation through a growing period. Three stages of growth, formation, growth, and completion. And this purpose of creation entailed creating a four-position foundation with God at the center where they can achieve the three great blessings. In other words, uh, perf uh, be fruitful, you know, mind-body unity, so that yourself can stand as a united being. And then to multiply, the second blessing, uh, have a relationship with another person and create an ideal family. And then bring the whole creation, the whole universe, as a good object partner to God. And that's what this kingdom of heaven that the Bible talks so much about would have been. And that was God's ideal, so that he could give joy to us, and we could give joy back to God, the entire creation. But as we know, one of God's creations, the archangel Lucifer, was jealous and envious at the love God was giving Adam and Eve. And he tempted them to get love for himself and to act on his desires which were not for the purpose of creation. It was to satisfy his own feelings. And unfortunately, he tempted Adam and Eve successfully and they fell. And they weren't able to obey God's commandment, do not eat the fruit. Wait till you're mature and complete the first blessing before to engage with a relationship with another person. And because of this, because Satan's the one who induced the fall, he was the center of their four position foundation. And this is where we get the concept of hell and the conflict throughout history and us being stuck in this midway position where Satan has claim over us because of his blood ties to us, but God also has claim to us because he's our creator. And while Satan's trying to keep us for himself, God is, as a heavenly parent, wants the best for his children. And he knows this is not the best. It's not even close to the best. It's below even the formation stage, spiritually speaking. So God conducted the providence of restoration to send various central figures throughout history that can raise our level of spirituality and morality by guiding people around them so that eventually we're able to go back to where Adam and Eve were, spiritually speaking, when they fell. And then God can restore or reverse what went wrong through the Messiah, who with finding a bride and, restoring, uh, and creating an ideal family, him as an individual person, his family as a good family, can be the model for the rest of humanity to create the ideal, to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. And we've talked about these very central figures such as Abel, Noah, sorry it's messy, Abraham, Moses, all people who have been trying to uh, bring us to the level where we can receive the Messiah. And what that level is termed as, as is the foundation for the Messiah. A foundation, a way of spirituality enough where we can receive the Messiah and his teachings. And that requires a foundation of faith, 
which is to do what Adam should have done, which is obey the commandment during the growing period. And then the foundation of substance, which is to reverse the fallen natures that happened during the fall through a relationship. with. And we see in the providence of restoration, the model for this foundation of faith and foundation of substance is someone in the position of Abel, establishing the foundation of faith. And then that Abel, who's a little more spiritually higher level, guides a position, someone in the position of Cain. Someone who, you know, can be guided closer to God through the Abel figure. But, as we've been talking about, it's never easy. It's never easy. And it took until Jacob to both create a foundation of faith and foundation of something. But that was only at the family level. And then Moses, we saw, tried to raise it to the level of a nation. But, as we heard this morning, that was extremely complicated, extremely difficult. There were a lot of frustrations, a lot of things to overcome. And even though he and Joshua, after he died, established this national foundation for the Messiah, it still wasn't enough because the Israelites weren't able to build a united nation. Their tribes couldn't unite. They you know, wavered in attendance of the object of faith. And we see this through the history of the rest of the Old Testament. Until, like I've been saying a lot, by the time Jesus comes and he's born in the manger at Bethlehem, there's not much of a nation for him. It's just the occupied province under Judea. But God says, you know what? That's okay. You know, it might not have been what I originally intended, but let's push forward because God doesn't give up. Now, a few points of context to remind ourselves before we conduct, uh, before we study what happened in Jesus' life. We need to remember that the rock in Moses' Moses' course was a rep- symbolic representation of Jesus himself. And this was the root of the objects of faith, which were symbols of the Messiah, that they could attend as the symbol of the Messiah in case they wavered in their faith towards the central figure. And another thing to point out, and it's talked about in part one of the divine principle, but a brief recap, is that before the Jewish people were looking for the Messiah, they were looking for the return of this prophet called Elijah, who was one of God's last prophets he sent to the northern kingdom of Israel to try and get them out of their faithlessness, to uh, restore a good nation state and you know, keep a foundation that God could send a Messiah to. And the Bible says that you know, he was this great prophet and he defeated all the worshippers of Baal, the, the priests and priestesses of Baal, who was like this false god that the Israelites were worshipping. Um, very interesting fact about Baal. The, the big, a big thing about Baal was like sexual rituals. And what was the fall about? Mm-hmm. You know, so you can see how in God's eyes, this was like one of the worst false gods to even worship. So he sent Elijah to defeat them. And it's written that before he could finish his mission, he rose in a fiery chariot and promised he would return. And then Malachi, 400 years before Jesus, so a few centuries after Elijah is put in the fiery chariot and sent away, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, he prophesies that, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So the Jewish people, through Scripture, know that Elijah needs to come before Jesus, before the Messiah. And what's also interesting about this prophecy is that it's a dual prophecy. Because remember, we have a portion of responsibility. God's will is absolute, but the time and way it's fulfilled depends on if we fulfill our own portion of responsibility. And it says that it's a great day, but it's also a dreadful day. And that the, the Messiah and uh that you know, Elijah and the Messiah can turn the hearts of people back to God, or God will strike the land with a curse. Really frightening stuff if you think about it. There's either great success or great failure. But this prophecy comes true. And it comes true when we read the first chapter of Luke, where it says, when an angel appears to Zechariah, the chief priest at the time, an angel of God comes to him and says, you will bear a son, or your wife will bear a son. And the angel says that he will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for a Lord a people prepared. And what was the name of this child born from Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth? 
a man named John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is this second Elijah, the return of Elijah, the person that the Jewish people were looking for so that it was the sign that, oh, the Messiah is not far away. And so it is John the Baptist, actually, that's supposed to restore the foundation of faith and foundation of substance. And why does it need to be restored? Didn't we already have a national level foundation? Well, first of all, this national level foundation has been eroded over hundreds of years. Secondly, because Satan claimed the rock in Moses' course, and because of the incident of the fiery serpents, and because of all the complaining and conditions that Satan could use against the Israelites and Moses, who was supposed to clear the path for Jesus, Satan now had implemented many thorns and you know roots and things we, Jesus could potentially trip over. So John the Baptist's responsibility was to remove these conditions that Satan could use against Jesus and to expand the scope of the foundation to the Messiah to the worldwide level. The divine principle calls it the worldwide course to restore Canaan. And the world at the time was the Roman Empire. At this time, they had, it was when Rome had had the most territory in their history. They stretched all the way from parts of west, the far west of Europe, you know, towards the Atlantic Ocean, to even, they say, in some parts, in some time in Roman history, like, they had inroads with India and China. Like, they were really powerful and really big. They had such an influence. And so this was the worldwide foundation John the Baptist was supposed to give to Jesus and release, it, uh, release him from these conditions. And for the foundation of faith, he was really successful. Um... It doesn't give a specific time period for how long the foundation of faith for John the Baptist was. So we can't say like for certain it was 40 years, for example, which has been the common theme of uh, separating from Satan and this foundation of faith. But we know that he had a powerful life of faith. And I'll use LOF as an abbreviation for that, life of faith. Because once he was born and he grew up, you know, while he was a kid, right, he's the child of the chief priest. So he is very well educated. He knows the law. He knows the scripture. He knows, you know, the prophecies that are happening, that, that Malachi says will happen. Um, and then he goes into the wilderness and he fasts and prays and meditates, reflects. And then he goes to the people and he tells them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Really preparing them for, for the coming of the Messiah. He's baptizing people in the Jordan River. So he lives out his faith. The foundation of faith is, is successful. And the Jewish people really respond to him because of the miracles surrounding his birth. That's how God used, uh, that's what God used to start this foundation of substance, to induce the people to follow him. And so the Jewish people were following him. They were like, oh, like, are you Elijah? Or they even asked, are you the Messiah? Like, oh my gosh, you're saying these amazing things? Like, you're really getting our act together, John. Like, man, like, we really need to repent. Like, please baptize me at the Jordan River. But as we learned about in part one, even though the foundation of substance was becoming successful, John the Baptist himself left the position of Abel. Meaning that after he baptized Jesus at the Jordan River, and, you know, the story goes that the doves came upon him, and basically John the Baptist, in a way, was like, kind of like, uh, what's the word, like, Telling him, like telling the people, like, yeah, this man's important. What happened afterwards, he kind of, you know, left his position in the sense that sometimes he, you know, thought he might be the Messiah. Sometimes he didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. And another thing that really pushed the Jewish people into confusion was when they asked him, are you Elijah? He said no. He said he wasn't Elijah. So for the Jewish people, if... There is no returning Elijah, and then Jesus starts his public ministry, proclaiming, like, you know, at face value, pretty wild things, like, I'm the fulfillment of the Sabbath, you know, you can only go to the kingdom of heaven through me. To them, to the Jewish people and leaders, they're like, what are you talking about? You go, you're saved through the law. You're saved through the law, not a person. What are you talking about? How can you be a savior and messiah if Elijah hasn't come? Malachi said, right there. It really confused them. And... At a certain point, even, you know, Jesus, like, told his disciples, like, 
yeah, he's Elijah. The Jewish people are like, what are you talking about? Like, you're a carpenter boy. Like, you have no education. You don't know what the scripture says. Like, John the Baptist is saying he's not. He's educated. He knows what he's doing. So, John the Baptist left the position of Abel, unfortunately. He didn't, he wasn't able to kind of fulfill God's calling for him. He didn't always recognize it. And the divine principle says in part one that, you know, when he was, you know, kind of in good relationship with God, like he felt his calling. But sometimes he would revert back to a state where that wasn't the case. And so because of that, he left the position of Abel and there could be no foundation of substance because there was no one for the Jewish people to unite with and raise their level of spirituality to the point where they could accept Jesus. Someone who, at face value, probably you know doesn't look like a Messiah. And this created... A big issue, because now Satan had room to work. Satan didn't, uh, Satan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, he was not released from his con conditions. Satan could use stuff like, you know, claiming the rock, or the, fi the, the fiery serpents, and, you know, all the things that happened in Moses' course. And so because of that, Jesus had to make his own foundation for himself. I mean, think about it, he's supposed to, you know, Save everybody, because that's what that's God's calling to him is bring everyone to me, you know. But Jesus has to now give his make his own foundation, and in a, in a way, it's a bit tragic because he has to, for the purpose of this condition, lower himself to a position of able, because the person who creates the foundation of faith and substance is is someone in the position of able, a child not someone in the position of parent. The position of parent in this condition is God. But it's nuanced, right? Because Jesus is still the Messiah. He's still, you know, he doesn't have original sin and all these things. But he still had, for this specific purpose, he was in this position of child. Meaning that Satan could, you know, accuse him. Because child implies that you're not fully mature. And that's how Satan was able to tempt Adam and Eve, because they were in a state of immaturity. The principle of creation states that once you, you know, mature, and, you know, you've com completed the first blessing, you are able to have the authority of God's creatorship. You're able to have dominion over the creation, including the angels. So, how does Jesus restore the foundation of faith? Jesus, it says in the Bible, endured 40 days in the wilderness, fasting. But something else happens as soon as this is about to end for him. Satan comes to him and tries to tempt him three times. Very famous story in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 4. Because Satan now has a condition to attack him, to see if he can try and make sure that the Messiah doesn't succeed. Because for Satan, these central figures were a threat, Jesus is a threat on a whole new level. He, Satan knows that if Jesus succeeds, he is done for. He can't get this love all to himself. Human beings will be like unshackled from Satan and be able to 100% go to God. So the first temptation Jesus, uh, Satan gives Jesus is, turn these stones into bread. That's interesting. Stone. Oh, like the rock that Satan has claim over. He has this claim over the symbolic root of Jesus himself. But Jesus immediately replies, not even questioning or having a moment of doubt, it seems, from the story of the Bible, where it says, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, he's saying, I don't listen to you. I listen to the commandment, what Adam should have done in the Garden of Eden. And so because of this, he was able to restore and complete the first blessing with respect to this condition. He did not do what you know the Israelites did in the wilderness, which was complain about their hunger and thirst. Because that's what Satan was tempting Jesus to do. Like, you know, you're the Messiah, just get, get some food for yourself. Like, don't worry about God's word. Don't worry about that. You know, get get the the food you, you need, or so you, you think you need. But Jesus said, no, my spiritual nourishment comes from the mouth of God. I will obey God's commandment no matter what. And so because of this, he was able to release himself 
if the foundation of substance would be successful from this condition of the rock, we'd be able to. But as I said, Satan refuses to give up, man. I mean, he knows that everything he's done will be completely ruined in his eyes if Jesus succeeds. So he tempts him again, and the divine principle states that he has no really, he has no condition at this point, no real way to succeed in tempting him because if he's a perfected man, that means that he has the ability to have authority over the angels. And Satan is a fallen archangel. So Jesus can tell him to go away. He, Satan's supposed to listen to him now. But he tempts him again, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from the temple. He took him to the temple. And we learned last lecture that the temple is another symbol of the Messiah. But Jesus symbolically claimed that position already. He showed that he is this perfected man. He lived out his mission as the Messiah and his character. And so he said, it is also written, Satan, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You are not allowed to test me, Satan. You're not. You're not. Because I actually am able to tell you what to do as a Lord of creation. You can't have control over me. You don't have this condition. You're not tied to me. And not to mention that you, I am not in a position of child anymore. I've risen to the uh, position of perfected character. I am in the position of parent. You can't do that. But Satan's like, look, this Jesus, like, come on. I mean, I gave him, uh, you know, food. I, you know, he could be saved by angels. I mean, fun experience, I guess. But now Satan, on the third temptation, tells him, all this I will give you. He takes him to the top of a mountain, viewing like a bunch of cities and towns. He says, all this I will give you if you will just bow down and worship me. Just give up, Jesus. I'll give you everything. Just worship me, please. Worship me. Adam did. You worship me. But Jesus said, away with me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The role of angels is to be uh, teachers, to help human beings. And Satan wasn't doing that, so he said, away with you. You're not supposed to tempt me anymore. You shouldn't have been in the first place. You're supposed to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so because of these two temptations, these two additional temptations you overcame, and all of them together, he was able to restore these three great blessings. In other words, he released himself from... Satan's accusation. And if this foundation of substance can be formed, human beings are able to traverse the completion stage if Jesus can establish this foundation of substance and find his bride and complete the ideal of creation. But what happens? He goes out of the wilderness and begins his public ministry and faces a bunch of confused people who are like, who are you? Why are you saying you're the fulfillment of the Sabbath? Why are you hanging out with tax collectors? I mean, think of it. Your friend is, your friend is best buddies with the IRS. Right? Like, <laughs> like, who wants, like, like, are you going to give me a tax break? Like, pull some strings. Like, no one wants that. He's hanging out with prostitutes. He's hanging out with the low lives of Jewish society. He's hanging out with people who, in Jewish law, would be stoned to death. But he keeps trying to find followers by inducing the people to follow him through miracles. And when I say miracles, I mean a ton of miracles. You can read the Gospels, and every few chapters, it seems, he, per he performs a miracle. He heals the blind, he heals the sick, he even raises someone to life at one point, he kills the people who suffer from leprosy. All these crazy miracles. And the crowd, it's interesting because the crowds around him are like, whoa. But then none of them really follow him. They don't stick around. Except the very few people who Jesus was able to find. His disciples, you know, the twelve apostles, for example. People like Peter. But there's not enough. Because at this point, now the Jewish leadership is scared. They're scared because they're like, oh, this person's saying he's like the king. The Romans might get really angry because Caesar, to them, is their god, their king. And then also they probably feel threatened that this Messiah, Jesus, if he gets enough of a following, he might usurp their position of leadership. So the Jewish people begin, uh, the Jewish leadership, I should say, 
begin plotting against him. They begin plotting against him. And of course, the Jewish people are confused. You know, there's several stories in the Bible about he's debating the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the temple. Um, but there's just not enough unity with Jesus. There's not enough. But Jesus, like God, is not going to give up. Not because he's weak, not because he wants to just go an easier path. He wants to fulfill his full mission. So even though he begins prophesying to his disciples that, you know, like the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And all these things that get the disciples wondering, is he going to die? Is he going to sacrifice himself to something? What's going on here? He still, even though Judas Iscariot, one of his chief disciples, sells him for 30 pieces of silver. I mean, the Son of God, Messiah, the hope of all mankind. I mean, you, we may not realize it now, but I'm sure, like, if he's a spirit, someone in the spirit world, he must feel so regretful. He must feel so regretful that he wasn't able to understand. And it's understandable because there was so much confusion. So much confusion. And not to mention that in Jewish law, if you broke any of the laws, you would be stoned to death. So people were actually fearing for their lives, some of them. But Jesus still doesn't give up, even though... He knows that Judas Iscariot is going to betray him. It says in the Last Supper that, I know one of you will betray me. But he's still desperate to achieve his will. And so he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before the Romans are about to arrest him. right? Because the Jewish leadership had plotted with Judas Iscariot and the Romans to arrest him. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays, and he prays, asking God, you know, let this cup pass for me, not because... I will it, but for your will. In other words, please, God, if there's, is there any condition, anyone who, be, who can believe in me enough, anyone you can work through, that I can fulfill my full mission on earth? Because that's where the purpose of creation is fulfilled. It's on the earth. That's how spirit goes. That's how everything goes. Jesus knows that, he, that fulfilling it on the earth is so important. And he asks his disciples, please pray with me. Please pray with me. But... In, Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that they fell asleep three times. And each time, Jesus asks them, like, why are you sleeping? Please pray with me. I mean, my hour is at hand. And then finally, after the third time in Matthew, it says, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. So not even his disciples could have full unity and faith with him. And it gets worse when Peter sees Jesus being, you know, taken by the Romans. And a woman asks him, like, Peter, wait, you, like, don't you know him? Like, he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the guy who's saying all these crazy things. And, but also making all these miracles. But Peter says, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know. And then he, she asks again, and Peter says, I don't know. And then the third time, he not only says, I don't know, he yells at her, like, go away! I do not know this man! He didn't even have his chief disciple at, at one point. And even, you know, it says in the Bible that, you know, women were, you know, with him on his journey to the cross. But from the divine principle's perspective, no one was there completely. No one was there at all the moments, especially the moments that mattered. Especially the moments where Jesus was about to go the path of the cross because there was no foundation of substance. He couldn't clear the path. There was no one to clear it with him. And he goes on the cross. Now, in Satan's mind, it's like, oh, I got him. I got him. God, you, I'm, I'm going to break your heart again, God. I'm going to break it. I'm going to show you why you should have given me more love than Adam and Eve. I'm going to show you. By killing your only son from your direct spiritual lineage. I'll show you. But despite each nail on the cross, Jesus is still not giving in to Satan. He's still having absolute faith. And not just absolute faith. An absolute, godly, ideal relationship with God as his father. He's having an absolute unity with God. Something that... No one has achieved in human history. And the Bible even says that God forsake Jesus on the cross. So God wasn't there with Jesus. But Jesus still didn't care. He was like, God, you're my father. 
Nothing's going to change that. I'm not going to do anything that's going to prevent us from being father and son. Nothing. And then at the end, you know, at, like minutes before his crucifixion, he tells God not only that like I'm with you, uh, it's okay, but God forgive the people, forgive forgive the people that are killing me right now. Forgive the people that are crushing your dreams. Forgive the people that are going to make you wait thousands of years longer to get a true relationship with someone on the earth. Forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They don't know. They are confused. Everyone's confused. Everyone's confused. And so after, Satan, after Jesus dies on the cross and Satan thinks he's won and he's had the ultimate victory, Jesus is dead on the cross. He's on the cross. He's dead, God. Take that, he says. But God says, oh, no, no, no. Jesus is still my son. He never became your son. He never gave an ounce of loyalty or anything to you, Satan. Jesus was loving me and I was loving him and we were in complete oneness. So you can't that, take that away from me. And Satan used his ultimate power to kill Jesus. He used every condition, the rock, the fiery serpents, all the complaining, the confusion of the Jewish people, John the Baptist, unsure whether you know, he's this Elijah or not. He uses everything. And so God is able to use everything he has, which is Jesus' unconditional love, his blood on the cross. And because of that, Jesus three days later, is resurrected by God. He's resurrected. And he, as a spirit, right, he's tied. You know, he suffered so much, but he still is going to try and create this foundation of faith for himself. He's still going to try and give his, he's going to try and build the path all by himself. And he does this through 40 days on the earth with his disciples. Who, although they may have wavered at times during Jesus' life, when Jesus was on earth, they were so inspired by him. They were so inspired. Because let's remember, God couldn't use the Jewish people in the position of Cain anymore. They had killed his only son. It's like with Adam. Adam broke God's heart. That's one of the reasons why God couldn't use him. Similarly, God couldn't use the Jewish people anymore. And What's so sad is that the prophecy of Malachi comes true. The great curse of the Jewish people is the fact that a few decades later, and I believe 64 or 63 AD, the Romans completely obliterate the temple and scatter the Jewish people. And they have been scattered until the end of World War II and are still fighting for a nation state, if you think about that. This curse came to pass. But no one realized or thought about that. And it was really hard to, because there was confusion. There was all this stuff going on. But the disciples, after Jesus died as a spirit, they had absolute unity, absolute faith, absolute love with Jesus. To the point where when Jesus finally ascended to heaven, and you know this is a day in the Catholic Church called Pentecost, at the Pentecost, the Great Commission was given. Preach the good news. The good news being that if you believe in me, you accept Jesus as this personal savior, you will be reborn spiritually. And the disciples completely unite. They go throughout Judea. They preach the gospel at the risk of their lives, at the risk of being stoned to death. The son of, some of them actually being stoned to death. And finally, through the miracle of Jesus' resurrection and through the unity of the disciples with Jesus, the foundation for the Messiah is laid, and for the first time in history, rebirth can happen in the form of God at the center, Jesus as the spiritual true father, the Holy Spirit as the spiritual true mother, this spiritual Adam and Eve restored, giving us spiritual rebirth. And this is the phenomenon that of Christianity, of how millions and billions of people have, have expressed whether you believe in religion or not, in my opinion, it's like, at a certain point, we can't doubt all these testimonies of being spiritually revived by Jesus, by people's lives being completely turned around by believing in Jesus and being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So let's give Jesus and the Holy Spirit and his disciples a round of applause. And especially his disciples, I mean, they had a complete turnaround. 
from when they were following Jesus. They spread the Christian movement. They spread the basis for Western culture. But, you know, I feel like there's always like a caveat in the DP. It's like a success, but... And the but on this victory is that... And, you know, it expresses it really clearly, actually, in Romans chapter 7, in this really famous quote from St. Paul where it says, Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin working within me. In other words, our bodies are still vulnerable to Satan. Our bodies are still in this midway position. And we still have this contradiction. I mean, we feel it all the time. Our spirit is renewed. We're like, oh, we heard, we read the Bible. You know, I felt Jesus. I, I felt the Holy Spirit. I'm learning the DP. You know, I'm, I'm having this great conversation with someone. But then eventually, your body is like, mm, I want to sleep. I'm tired. I don't want to hear the DP anymore. I don't want to read the Bible. And then it kind of sways you away. And this is why Jesus prophesied during his ministry that he must come again. And find his true bride in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where this second coming of Jesus with his bride on the earth can give physical salvation as well. To give a path where not just our spirits, but a whole being, our body, can achieve the purpose of creation. But, you know, in the divine principle and parallels of history, we've been talking a lot about history repeats itself. And the divine principle gives a very, like, concerning but important warning about the followers of Jesus in this day, and people in general in today, where it says, they're referring to the Christians, but I would, my, my personal opinion, I would say everybody, is their situation is extremely precarious. They are liable to fall into disgrace and great misfortune. That's crazy. The followers of Jesus now, they even could face a similar fate to the Jewish people. The way this can come about is if they repeat the mistake of not recognizing the Messiah. If confusion happens and you know there's not enough you know, uh, foundation for the Messiah, the second advent might have to restore the foundation of faith and substance himself, just like Jesus had to. But, as... And we're not covering it here, but as the end of the DP talks about, God is creating an environment where it is almost impossible. You know, you can't say impossible, but almost impossible, so that as long as the second coming uh, is alive, he. Will, I'm sorry. As long as you know, there's at least something going for the second coming. Like he's not going to die. The environment won't allow him to be to die. Meaning that if he is this Messiah, this perfected individual, he can never fail. He's not going to waver. Because that's his purpose, to be the model for humanity. And this environment that God wants to create will allow the second coming to fulfill his complete purpose on the earth. To also give physical salvation. Because God's goal is that even if Satan has conditions, the environment won't kill him. Because what God wants to do with the second coming is bring us to the position of true sons and daughters. Because at the fall, we were at the point of servant of servants. Not even servants. Below the angels, below creation, below everything. But through Abraham's family, we became in a different type of relationship. A little bit higher. You know, servant. Master-servant relationship. We see that through the Old Testament. And through the spiritual rebirth that Jesus can give us and the Holy Spirit, while we can't be complete true sons and daughters of God because Satan can still claim us through our bodies, through our spirits we can become almost like adopted sons and daughters of God. Like adopted children. And through the second coming and his bride, we have the potential to be true sons and daughters of God, and fulfill this ideal of creation. That's the 
kind of promise that Jesus gave to us at the end of his life. That even though things didn't work out now, God's not going to give up. And that's one of the biggest lessons from this course. God never gives up. Even if it involves sacrificing his only son, he's not going to give up. And it also demonstrates our portion of responsibility is so important. And not just, you know, the people who are supposed to follow the Messiah, even Jesus is. I mean, in the, his utmost devotion to God, his utmost unity with God, was his choice. Because love is a choice at the end of the day. And Jesus chose his relationship with God at the end of the day, which created this amazing miracle, which created this huge spiritual revival in the Christian movement. And another lesson that this course teaches us is that, like, at the end of the day, we're remembered through our results. Our results matter. You know, John the Baptist was this amazing figure. But from the divine principle's perspective, how do we really remember him? You know? And lastly, I would just say, let me see, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Our faith does matter. Like I mentioned just now with Jesus, but our faith matters. Our faith can bring miracles. That's the nature of faith. You don't always know everything. And that's really tough for me especially. Because I like everything to be laid out, cleared, proven. But that's the nature of a life of faith, in a way. You can't always know everything. But that's why it's so important to, through the Spirit and truth, have a relationship with God through prayer, meditation, however you do that. And, and study the truth, the scripture. And through that, we can fulfill our portion of responsibility today. And through that, we can help the second coming and this Messiah that God sends when he does send him. And I know, I, I personally know that to be true because if Jesus is faith, which is like the highest standard, the highest possible standard, the ideal of faith, led to a movement of Christianity that has changed the world forever, if we have a small portion of that faith and, and kind of relationship with God, I know that we in this room, despite how imperfect we all may be, despite our own individual you know, struggles, even just a, a minuscule portion of what Jesus did and his you know, standard can change the world. And I know we can change the world. And this is why we study Jesus and study all these central figures, to learn from them, their mistakes and their successes, so that we can contribute to God's providence today and become his central figures. There's this amazing passage in the divine principle where it's, it's called the providence of restoration in I. And I didn't plan this, but since it's the last lecture, I really feel it's important to read. Kind of like the divine principle's calling to us as readers. And... It says, as an individual, each one of us is a product of the history of the providence of restoration. Hence, the person who is to accomplish the purpose of history is none other than I myself. I must take up the cross of history and accept responsibility to, to fulfill its calling. To this end, I must fulfill in my lifetime, horizontally, through my efforts, the indemnity conditions which have accumulated through the long course of the providence of restoration vertically. Only by doing so, can I stand proudly as a fruit of history, the one whom God has eagerly sought throughout his providence? And it says, and it goes on, to become such a historical victor, I must understand clearly the heart of God when he worked with past prophets and saints, the original purpose for which God called them, and the details of the providential missions which he entrusted them. We are people God can use. Let's do it. Mm -hmm.